Welcome again to On Our Mind, Bill Mobley, UCSD Neurosciences. And as you uh, may know, we're doing a whole series of uh, brief discussions, brief uh, chats about Alzheimer's disease, and I'm very pleased to have me with me in the studio Larry Squire, who's made so many important contributions to a really important topic when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, the topic of memory. So Larry, thank you for being with me. I, I thought I'd provide a little bit of context as we start talking uh, by uh, mentioning that this brain we, we have has been uh, something that's been the topic of uh, men's fascination for a very long time and memory problems uh, certainly of historic interest as well. So I wanted to read from Hippocrates. This is 400 BC. And men ought to know that from nothing else but the brain come joys, delights, laughter and sports and sorrows, griefs, despondency and lamentations. And by this and in an especial manner we acquire wisdom and knowledge and, and see and hear and know what are foul and what are fair, what are bad and what are good, what are sweet and what unsavory. And by the same organ we become mad and delirious and fears and terrors assail us. All these things we endure from the brain when it is not healthy. And then from Lear, from Shakespeare of course, Lear says, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. And all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me. Shakespeare's King Lear, 1606. Larry, the topic of brain disease, of problems with brain function, and memory in particular have been on our mind for a very long time. Please tell us a little bit about what you've done to explore memory, and then I'm gonna have a couple of questions for you to help us answer, if you will. Mm. Well, we've been interested in memory for a long time, um, and we've uh, been interested in questions we might, we'd call these questions systems level questions, questions about what memory is. Is memory one thing or many things? What parts of the brain are important for memory? What kind of jobs do they do? And uh, one could say that, I mean, this problem has a long history, but up until recently, by recently I mean 1950, <laughs> uh, memory was thought to just to be a, a, a capacity that was intermingled with all the other things that the brain did, intellectual functions, perceptual functions. So the real breakthrough came, and one could say the modern era of the study of memory started in the 1950s when the, the great psychologist Brendan Milner described the profound effects on memory of bilateral removal of the medial aspect of the temporal lobe, which was carried out as an experimental surgery in those days to relieve severe epilepsy in a patient who famously became known as HM. Mm. And I might just show you here uh, where, what we mean by the medial temporal lobe. We're referring to this, the temporal lobe is this area here, and the areas that were removed included the hippocampus and the amygdala and this surrounding cortex, was, which was very poorly understood back in the 1950s. And so the immediate question became, well, what are the structures that are important for memory that were removed in HM? Because what happened as a result of the surgery was that HM developed a profound memory impairment. Tell us a little bit about HM. What could he do and what could he not do? Well, he was profoundly disabled, and unexpectedly so, by the, by the surgery. Uh, and his primarily, primary problem was that he couldn't form new memories. So he had old memories. That's somewhat of a topic of confusion, actually, because he was young enough at the time of the surgery that he didn't have a lot of old memories. Uh, the, the dominant view is that he did have access to his oldest, earliest memories. Yeah. So the question became, well, what are the structures that are important for memory? And that work had to be done in experimental animals, so it could be done systematically. And uh, that's work that we took on here at UCSD over the years. It took about 12 years to answer the question, but we now know uh, what the important structures are in the, in the temporal lobe that are important for memory. And I'll illustrate it here on another image. This shows the location of the important structures in the three species that have been important to this tradition of work, the human brain, the monkey brain, and the and the rat brain. And in color here, you see these areas of the inner surface, the medial surface of the temporal lobe, 
that include the hippocampus, which one doesn't see here, but is buried beneath the surface in about this position here. Or, uh, and it includes these structures that lie along the parahippocampal gyrus, as indicated on the screen, the parahippocampal cortex in the back, the entorhinal cortex in the middle, and the perirhinal cortex in the front. And these are the structures that were important in understanding HM's memory impairment. These are the structures that are important for laying down new memories, for forming memories. And without those structures, one is, so as we call it, say, amnesic. Mm -hmm. So HM's study, the study of this poor man who, who underwent surgery to try to prevent seizures, it had a huge impact on really helping us understand the brain and, and, and memory. And, and there were other patients as well that helped create this map for us. That's right, you know, HM was really the first and, the, uh, the, and, uh, and it was a, a, a tragic outcome of the surgery. The surgery hasn't been done since, uh, but sometimes surgery is done for epilepsy now, but usually just one side of the brain is worked on and less is removed and the minimum amount is, re is removed, the, the diseased tissue. Uh, so, we, so we learned from HM for the first time that there are these important memory structures and other patients came along as well. You could say that the animal work was the foundation of it all, because the animal work, uh, in the case of the animal work, one can work systematically and, and, and work in a rigorous cumulative way towards understanding what the identity of these structures uh, actually is. So there's more than one kind of memory. Is that true? Yeah, well, that was one of the big discoveries uh, along, along the path after HM, that uh, in, in initially just on the, on the on first glance, in an initial study, it, it appeared that HM was impaired in all of memory. That is, he couldn't make new memories, and that's the story. But it was, it was first discovered that he had, despite his profound in, uh, deficits, he had the ability to learn a, a motor skill. Hmm. And the initial, this was done in 1962, and it was a big, a big discovery, namely that, he, uh, that, that was a famous task where he had to trace the outline of a star in a mirror. And, Unexpectedly, he learned this skill at a normal rate and over a period of few days performed perfectly, even though he didn't remember he'd done it before. So there was a kind of memory, but it wasn't the kind that about events and facts. It was a different kind of a right. skill memory. Right. Well, it was, the first, it was the first hint that there might be something else, and it was a skill memory. Mm. But the, what, the, what, what came later and what was, be, was more fundamental was the discovery that that was just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. There was a whole group of memories a whole, whole group of learning and memory abilities, things that you that deserve the term memory because they reflect the effects of experience on behavior, but which are intact in patients like HM and which lie outside the province of these medial temporal lobe structures. I'll just show you a, a chart which gives you a sense of the, uh, the range of these abilities. This is the, the way that many of us think about long-term memory now. We're divided into two major categories declarative memory and non-declarative memory. So declarative memory is our memory for facts and events. Declarative memory is what we mean when we use the term memory in everyday language. It's our ability to remember what we did yesterday and what we did a year ago. And, and it's our, it refers to our ability to lay down new memories for new facts and new events. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the integrity of this, this medial temporal lobe structure that we were just uh, re was speaking about. But uh, in contrast to declarative memory, we have something that we call non-declarative memory, which is an umbrella term to describe a whole group of abilities, which all of which lie outside the medial temporal lobe, and which are intact in memory impairment in memory impaired uh, patients. So this includes skills, not just motor skills, but perceptual skills. The the early example that we uh, were able to demonstrate was the ability to read mirror reverse text, which isn't a motor skill, but it's a skill, and you can everybody can learn to do it with practice, and patients can do it. Uh, there's a phenomenon called priming, simple kinds of conditioning like uh, Pavlovian conditioning, uh, simple forms of learning like habituation. Uh, it's a whole variety of things that depend on different brain structures other than the temporal lobe, the caudate nucleus, the neocortex, the amygdala, the cerebellum. So there's a whole variety of uh, memories. And the, so the key, the key discovery here was that memory is not a single faculty of the mind, that, that, that there's different forms of memory and they depend on different brain systems. So even though we focus on declarative memory and, and when patients with Alzheimer's come to us, they have an especial problem here. Truth is memory is more than just declarative memory. And it's more than just the hippocampus. 
it's a number of brain structures. Yeah, that's right. A declarative memory is an important kind of memory, and it's what we re most rely on, and it is the kind of memory that's affected I initially in most cases of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, but non-declarative memory, see, the, the thing about non-declarative memory to keep in mind is that declarative memory is conscious memory, but non-declarative memory is not conscious. You know, it refers to the ability to acquire skills gradually. When we don't have, the, motor skills is always the best example. If you, if you learn a tennis stroke, it's not that you consciously explain what you're doing. You, you, in fact, the, it, whereas declarative memory is expressed through recollection and through behavior, like recall, non-declarative memory is expressed through performance. So you may have, a, if I ask you about your tennis stroke, you'll, you'll demonstrate it to me. The knowledge is embedded in the ability to, to carry out the procedure. You also may have a declarative memory that you use the stroke to win a particular point on a particular day, but that's the operation of declarative memory. Very interesting. So different kinds of memory, different brain structures, and presumably within those brain structures, different ways that neurons talk to each other to make that skill or that memory possible. Yeah, the memories are laid down in different areas of the brain. So the, the hippocampal system works on memory in one kind of way in interaction with the neocortex where memories are ultimately stored, long-term memories are ultimately stored. Talk about that just a little bit. So if I learn, um, if I learn uh, my passport number today, uh, I may need to practice it a few times, but eventually my new passport number from today, uh, it's enabled, of course, the learning's enabled by hippocampus, but ultimately I'm, I'm gonna store that in, in neocortex, am I not? That's right, yeah, yeah the declarative memories are stored in, in a distributed fashion in the neocortex, not everywhere and not all in the same way, because the key idea, of course, is the neocortex is a highly specialized and differentiated structure with different parts of the neocortex specialized for different kind of jobs, whether it be some spatial cognition or vision or olfaction or touch. And so memories are distributed within the compartments that are involved in the job of doing that kind of memory. So if you were memorizing your passport number, there'd be areas of the brain, there are areas of the brain that are particularly important in number knowledge. Those areas would be important for storing that. And sequential knowledge, other areas of the brain in the frontal lobe are important for sequential knowledge. And so that specialized areas would come to play in, 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 the, in the storage, in the long-term storage of a memory, depending on what exactly it is you're learning and remembering. You know, as I was reading a very, this is a very nice review uh, for the annual reviews of neuroscience. Uh, Larry and John Wickstead, both from UCSD, uh, wrote, a, uh, wrote about uh, the cognitive neuroscience of human memory since HM, a fascinating article, very, very beautifully written. And here are some really interesting stories about people who had uh, injury to their cortex. And, and can you just relate one of those? To, I mean, I just was fascinated by uh, a man who was an artist who had a lesion and had a problem. Can you just talk about that case? Yeah. Well, these are patients who have air, damage to specific areas of neocortex that are involved in particular kinds of jobs. And in this case, they are, the areas that were damaged are areas important for color knowledge. Right. And this, this patient lost the ability to learn new colors because he couldn't appreciate colors. But because those are not just, it's not just doing a memory job, it's a knowledge job, it's a stories job, he also lost the ability to image, to, to mentally create images that involve color. Hmm. So he knew intellectually that grass was green, but he, he reported that he was not able to imagine green grass. So his memory was now, this artist, once artist, now had a memory of colors that was really shades of gray. That's right. Shades Amazing. Of gray. Shades of gray. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, there's much to learn about memory, Larry, and we know you'll, you'll be leading the way in so many important ways. You were mentioning to me before we started that there's a new paper that's out and that uh, you've made some interesting new discoveries about hippocampus, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that, uh, you know, in, in a sense, in the field of neuroscience, I mean, much, much of what we've learned has depended on the animal research, because with animal, re with monkeys and with rats, one can, these are mammals, and they have, all have a hippocampus, and they all have a neocortex, and so one can model these uh, events, the, these, these uh, syndromes and these, these facts about memory that we study in humans, one can do that in animals. 
Nevertheless, in interesting human cases, and, and, and occasionally one has the opportunity to do things in humans that one can't do in animals. You can't ask animals questions. They can't report their autobiography. Uh, they, they, can't, they can't do a lot of uh, things that humans can do. So uh, we, we had the opportunity, uh, John Wickstead and myself, to study patients who are receiving, being monitored for potential epileptic surgery. So these patients have electrodes indwelling in the brain for a period of a couple of weeks, during which time they're being monitored for seizures and so that the locus of the seizures can be identified and then they can be evaluated for possible surgery. Now, during the time that they have these electrodes in, they're sitting in the ward and they're uh, usually happy to participate in the simple experimental procedures invo involving memory. And so, yes, in this paper that we just recently reported, uh, we studied the uh, the nature of episodic memory, that is, that this is list learning of words, list learning, list learning of words. And what we found is that, the, that, there's, that in, within the hippocampus, there are neurons that are responsive to successful recall, but it's a very sparse code and a very distributed code. So it, 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 the bottom line of it is that each word has one or two neurons that it'll excite, and each neuron is responsive to one or two words that was learned. Not all the words. It's not a, a memory signal. It's not that they're responsive to all the familiar words. Each each neuron has its has, has a word uh, from the old list that it responds to, and each and each word has finds a neuron or so that it likes. So about two and a half percent of the neurons uh, that we record from show a response to memory. So the the key of finding is that it's a sparse code and it's a distributed code. Beautiful. Very exciting, and and I think it just uh, shows again the value of being able to understand the brain using modern technologies and again to do it in a way that builds on our ability to interact with uh, animal models but humans as well and of course at some point um, at some point we go back to Hippocrates and we say he was right and we're going to learn more and more about why he was right. Larry thanks for being with me. Great to hear from you and great to have you with me. Thanks very much for your attention and tune in again to On Our Mind.